Welcome to episode 19 of the Guns and Yoga podcast. My name is Wendy Hummel. In today's episode, I talk with Dr. Jennifer Jennifer Prohaska. She has a postdoctoral fellowship in neurorehabilitation psychology and received a Bachelor of Arts, master's degree, and a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Kansas. Wow. She spent nearly two decades focusing on the needs of those on the front lines. Her passion is to help serve those who help others by providing the critical tools that they need to navigate the stressors they experience on a daily basis. She has also conducted extensive research on PTSD in first responders, treatment modalities for first responders, building resiliency in first responders, modification of empirically supported treatments for first responders, new hire selection of police officers, depression, specifically focusing on biological factors and childhood trauma and resiliency. I first met Dr. Prohaska about five years ago in a training class that she was instructing. Her no-nonsense approach makes her a great fit for working with cops and other first responders. She really has a knack for explaining difficult concepts in a way that's easy to understand. Besides her practice, she consults, teaches, and works closely with War Horses for Veterans during her command-level peer support training that she teaches. She explains the intuitive nature of horses in our conversation and that the feedback that they can provide is so priceless. Those that go into the arena with the horses help bring awareness to them that they otherwise may not have known. It makes them aware of the energy that they bring into different situations, how they relate to coworkers or those that they supervise, and it can be extremely eye-opening. We also covered the gamut of first responder mental health related topics. She discusses a statistic that one in five first responders are likely to meet diagnostic criteria for PTSD. Trauma is not a competition and we're all so different and how oftentimes first responders trauma can come in themes, which I never thought of this way, such as I can't trust my abilities. I can no longer trust my safety in the world. I have no control or I'm powerless. We can all get activated by different things, but the theme is the same. Dr. Prokaska also uses very unique language, which I absolutely love. She talks about the, quote, hairball of trauma and how once we untangle one hair, the other traumas that we have are easier to unwind. She also says taking the persistence beats resistance approach with coworkers or friends or loved ones who may be struggling, meaning that just keep on trying, keep approaching them. And finally, we discuss how we need to pay attention to our retirees prior to their retirement. Dr. Prohaska is dedicated to the mental and emotional health of first responders, and she has helped save many lives in the Kansas City area and beyond. If you find value in this episode, please share it, give us a review, and if you'd like to be notified of future episodes and want to receive our future newsletter, you can shoot me an email at wendy at bluelineyoga.com. Subscribe on our Podbean website, and also just contact me with any suggestions for future guests or topics you'd like to hear about, or if you're local and need help locating a resource, therapist, or just want to reach out, I would love to hear from you. Welcome to the show, Dr. Prohaska. So glad to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. This has actually been a long time coming. So for uh, for those who don't know who you are, um, you are a police psychologist in the Kansas City area, and you do some amazing work working directly with first responders, not just in your private practice, but you do so many other things. So I think what I'm going to do is just like hand it over to you and tell everyone, first of all, about your training and your background and how it is that you came to work with this population. Sure, sure, sure. So um, I came to work with this population kind of in a backwards way. It was almost like by chance, but kind of my background is I'm from Kansas City. So born and raised um, a suburb of Kansas City, um, played a lot of sports as a kid, like pretty competitive, um, ended up going to the University of Kansas for undergrad. And then um, I got super, super, super lucky in the sense that I got actually taken on into their graduate program. So it's a PhD program for clinical psychology with a kind of a specialty in health psychology and like neuropsychology. So um, I don't know how it happened. I just got super lucky. Um, and I got admitted to the program and I got my PhD um, at the University of Kansas, which 
at the time I was there, the clinical psych program I was in is actually top 25 in the nation. So um, I got super lucky. I literally feel like, man, I, I pulled the wool over somebody's eyes to get here because uh, I didn't <laughs> I didn't think I could do it, but I did. So um, got through that program and then I started at uh, my internship. So after you do grad school uh, for your PhD, you've got to do an internship to wrap up your, your actual PhD. So uh, I did that at KU Med. And at that place, I mean, I did all sorts of cool stuff. I got rotations through like even like cardiac units and burn unit, ICU, um, inpatient, you know, psych stuff. And um, man, I just loved it. Even a little bit like like behavioral pediatrics. And I don't obviously work with kids now because I cuss too much, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I had a great time there. And then as part of your PhD, you've got to do like a fellowship or a residency. And so I also got extra lucky and got to stay at KU Med again and did my uh, residency and fellowship in uh, basically neuro rehab psychology. So basically my specialty was like brain and spinal cord injuries in particular. Uh, and I loved it. It was really, really, really neat, which is, it's, it was an interesting, like how I fell into it. And uh, in the sense that my biggest fear is actually getting a spinal cord injury. So, um, I, I, I got thrown into the fire there and kind of, and really, really learned some pretty cool stuff um, during my residency. I also worked burn unit and ICU there too. And then trauma units. So like people who are going through, you know, getting shot, stabbed, you know, traumatic amputations from farming equipment, like, you know, in Kansas, that happens, of course. So, yeah. um, I mean, I got some, I got some really, really freaking awesome like learning experiences out of that. And then, um, I actually got hired on as a clinical faculty at uh, KU Med Center. They put me where, look, honestly, when you're the lowest lady on the totem pole, it's just like coming into any first responder culture, you know, you get the shifts or the assignment that is the hard one or that nobody really wants. And so, sure. um, and, and some people want this, but I got assigned to the cancer center. So my job was to basically work with people who were largely terminal, I'd say, uh, and kind of prep them for, for dying. Um, that job sucked. I'll be honest with you, but it taught yeah. me a whole lot. So it was awful. I, I lasted like nine months. It wasn't KU's fault. It wasn't anybody's fault. It was just my mindset is so like forward focused. So when you put me with somebody and kind of, I have to watch, you know, their last moments and like their suffering. Uh, I did not do well there. That was kind of tra traumatic for me. And I tell that story, you know, when I teach in, in peer support, I tell that story because I think it's important to realize like, look, some stuff's going to bother you and some stuff's not. Um, I did not think that cancer care would bother me. Um, I was way more thinking that like doing the gunshot wound stabbing, you know, burn unit stuff was going to bother me. And instead it was actually like the cancer stuff. So hmm. last of nine months decided, you know what, I think I want to go back into trauma. Um, <laughs> and I actually left KU without really a plan, which, uh, I think looking back, I was like, that was reckless, but I did, <laughs> I did leave, uh, without a total plan. And, I uh, ended up joining a private practice. And so in Kansas City, I started with a private practice uh, and it was working back in trauma. It was working with first responders and doing forensic work. And I had like, shoot, pretty little experience, honestly, directly with first responders, but I had quite a bit of trauma experience from working at the med center. Um, and I freaking love it. I fell in love with it like immediately. Uh, and I tell people all the time, like, if you asked me to go back and work with normal people, not first responders, I don't think I could do it. I think y'all have ruined me. I really do. I don't think I can do it anymore. <laughs> yeah, I believe that we did. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So that's kind of the backstory how I got here. Um, let's see. Um, I'm for science certified. Like I've I've uh, done some training with kind of really understanding, you know, my neuropsych background. Uh, I, I think a lot about the brain and behavior and and the mechanics and biomechanics of how things happen and. So uh, I got four science certified and only like a handful of psychologists in the U.S. have done that. So um, I'm pretty proud of that thing. That was 2018. Um, yeah. So that's kind of my background and I really can't do anything else. I am ruined. So here I am. <laughs> wow. You have a really impressive background. I mean, you know, it sounds like everything for whatever reason, everything that you did just kind of led up to where you are today, even though you didn't necessarily ever think about working with first responders, because usually I ask people whether they're first responders or therapists that work with first responders, like, why did you choose to work with this population? And sometimes you'll hear, well, somebody in my family was a first responder, and obviously not with you, right? Nope. Yeah, I have no first responder relatives. This was more like 
man, this is just a really good personality fit for me uh, Mm -hmm. right out the gate. I mean, I was a, I think I, I think I'm pretty open about this. I was definitely like the black sheep in grad school. So um, I did not fit amongst, you know, ye other therapists. I did not, I was not a good fit. And um, the black sheep thing worked out okay because it's a good fit for this population, I think. So, yeah, I, just in knowing you for, for the past few years, um, I can definitely see why, why you pick this profession and why you're so good at it. Because yeah, I agree. Your, your personality is great mix with, with cops and other first responders. <laughs> oh man, that's so great. That, thank you. I appreciate it. That's a great compliment. So thank you. Well, it, it is true because when I met you a few years ago, it was because you were teaching a class during a peer support training that I was going through and, and the feedback, it wasn't just me that thought, it. I mean, the feedback from the people in the class and then subsequent classes. I mean, you're just really down to earth and personable. You have a very good way of delivering very, heavy information. I mean, the brain, even though I love it, it's, it's, it can be very hard to wrap your brain around the brain information, right? And to, to get first responders to understand how it relates to what they do day in and day out. And you just have a really good, you know, knack of, of being able to talk about that really intricate stuff in a very easy, practical way to understand. So. Oh man, that's great. I, I love hearing that. Cause I think that look, what, what we go through mentally in this career. And I say, we, you know, the collective, we, um, it is really complicated and we don't know everything about the brain and we don't know everything about the disorders that I treat. We don't, I mean, it is a great, you know, human mystery, what actually is really happening. And so as much as I can break it down into like digestible chunks for people, um, I think when people understand what's going on with them, that in itself kind of starts the healing process. I really do think that. So yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Understanding and just that knowledge and information, I think, can really go a long way. I think so, too. I just, you know, for the longest time, and, I, and, and you know this, that the culture was not real receptive to even talking about what's probably happening. And so um, I think that that silence is a killer to some extent. You know, if you don't know what's going on, it can really leave you at risk for thinking that you're never going to come back from the edge. And that's not true. And I, that's the message I try to pass along a lot of times is like, guys, the conditions you have are are treatable. They're manageable. This is not a death sentence. This is not the end of your career. And that's what I always try to push too. And that's really important because a lot of times, and I know, you know, this, I'm preaching to the choir here, but there's so much shame and isolation. And I think once that, we can really make people understand that an injury to the brain or, you know, what's going on with the brain should be viewed no differently than other diseases. That's, that's at least my take on it, like cancer or, you know, heart disease. Like, why do we view that differently? Yeah. And and we do. And I, and as a culture, we're trying really, really hard to do that, to not, Mm -hmm. to not view it differently. But I think that, you know, stigma is one reason that people don't get help. Of course, but actually when we've kind of looked at the numbers, one of the more predominant reasons why people don't get help is actually they're so hyper independent that many first responders think that they can just pull themselves up by their own like psychological bootstraps, if you will, you know? Yeah. And, and so I think, yes, stigma is a thing. And I think honestly, we were doing so much better at addressing that. I'm seeing a massive change in the last even like two, three years, but uh, we still have to fight the battle of like, people who are drawn to this field are hyper independent and they love solving their own problems. And when people get so deep down into like that mental dark space or that hole, um, sometimes, you know, you need a little assistance to get out of it. So that's a really good point. And so if there's somebody that's listening that might be in that situation, how do you reach out to people and tell them that it is okay when you have a personality like that? Like, how is it that you can, can make them understand that it's okay to, to, to go to therapy, get help. Okay. So yeah, like super complicated question actually, but I'll try to break it down. <laughs> okay. So okay. first of all, like, I think one of the biggest things we can do is stuff like this, right? So stuff that normalizes this, so podcasts are like the wave of the future, you know, and, and getting the message out, especially the younger generation. I always tell people like, um, you know, a cultural change takes about five to seven years. And so, um, you know, we just have to keep pushing and keep, keep pushing the message too, I think through stuff like this, but then you look, if your culture changes in your organization, um, and like, it's normal, you know, to talk about stuff like this, like my favorite organizations I work with are the ones that have been doing either debriefings or some kind of like psychological health for officers 
for a while because it is so incredibly normal for them to just reach out, even like text me or email me, gosh, freaking Facebook message me even, you know, like, hey, doc, I need something. Um, and, and the stigma and it seems to be dissipating quite a bit that way. And then when people need help, I think they're way more likely to ask their peers um, because their peers are also talking about it more. They'll be like, hey, I went to Doc's office or, you know, hey, I saw therapy over here. I did this program. It was really helpful. And so um, really, I think word of mouth uh, and somebody having a positive experience in your organization and passing that along is what makes a huge difference. Yeah. And but I don't want to like undercut the importance of the actual therapist too, because I have heard, well, no, I'm no, seriously. And this is something I was probably going to talk to you about later on, but since we're talking about it now, I, anytime I have, I've had a few other therapists on the podcast before, and I always ask, you know, cause it's so hard to come up with this that, that like magic ingredient that makes somebody a good fit for this culture. And so I think it says a lot about you that people feel comfortable, like reaching out to you. Cause that's not always the case because there's a lot of therapists that may want to work with this population, but you also, in my opinion, you need to be willing to like also work the same hours and go out, you know, be, be a little bit more reachable and accessible. And that can be hard for some therapists too, even though they may enjoy working with them and they be good at it. There's, there's more to it. That is so funny that you bring that up because uh, that is absolutely like the challenge for my practice over here in 2020 and 2021 was um, growing, you know, cause the need in Kansas city in particular and across the Metro has gotten so significant that um, we were just having like, you know, you know, two and three month wait list, which is not okay when people are not doing well. So we went on this like quest to hire a new therapist and um, it was probably one of the more frustrating journeys I've had in my career, to be honest with you. Um, you know, personally here at this practice, look, we're in a large metropolitan city and um, we advertised and advertised and advertised for therapists. And we got some people who wanted to come into private practice and and we interviewed those folks, but we interviewed 31 different people before we finally found two good fits. And so mm. like, like it's tough. And I think that the thing is like, in order to work with this population, your therapist has to be really comfortable with directly challenging people, uh, getting to the point ASAP, uh, being a little bossy. I'll be honest with you. I think that's probably I, bossy is something I own with pride. Like I'm, I'm mm -hmm. proud of my bossiness, you know, as well. You should. <laughs> Thank <be>. you. <laughs> <laughs> and I own that. And so, uh, and then you have to be just like, really take the reins. I think when people come out of, you know, therapy school, you know, their, their programs, they are kind of taught like, this is a collaborative thing and let the patient take the lead. And the patient is always right. And there's some degree of that that I think is true, but with this population, like, Man, by the time they walk through your therapy door and into your office, man, they are really, really hurting. And so you have got this teeny tiny little window of vulnerability and you got to take the reins and you got to make sure that they understand like, hey, we got this. We've done this before. Like you're special, but you're not that special type of thing. You know, we can we can fix you. You're not going to tell me anything I probably haven't heard before. Let's roll. Um, and that's the attitude I think that helps people feel comfortable. Yeah. And it is, it, I can't imagine it's gotta be a challenge, especially because this is a practice that you started. Is that, is that right? Yeah. So, uh, so it's your baby. So you want to make sure you've got the right people. Yes. And I'm picky. I'm super picky. Um, and I think that if any of my therapists that we have four, four other therapists, uh, you know, I, I'm the, the PhD here and then we've got, um, four other master's level clinicians that work here. And I think all of them would probably politely tell you like, man, she's super particular. <laughs> <laughs> um, but all the therapists I have here, they are regularly doing ride alongs and they're regularly engaged out with the culture. You know, you had talked about, you know, what helps therapists get embedded and like, you have got to be invested. You've got to take call after hours. Um, you know, you've really got to be able to get your hands dirty that you earn so much respect when you do that, I think, because they want to know the clients want to know that what they're going to bring into you, you've a either seen before or B, like, you're totally willing to go there with them. Because a lot of people won't. A lot of people will turn away in horror. You know, that is mm -hmm. not helpful. So. Yeah, and I have heard, as I'm sure you have too, just a lot of those horror stories about those therapists that just probably shouldn't, um, shouldn't be dealing with that population because they can't handle it. 
Yes, yes, yes. And, you know, especially in a rural state like Kansas, like when you have so many limited options, I feel really bad for the guys and gals out there working that are in a less populated area with less options. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. So if you don't mind, I kind of want to switch gears just a little bit. And we talked about this before we hit the record button, but if you could address like some of the issues, like kind of the big issues you see, obviously you can't talk about your clients. I'm not asking you to do that, but just issues that you see with our population. And, you know, in particular, we we were talking about trauma and addiction. Um, We also talked a little bit about childhood trauma, but, but whatever you think is, is relevant to start with just some of the things that you think might be important for people to hear. Sure. sure. And then this is probably like a, a whole podcast in itself just on, you know, issues, a clinical issue at a time. But so the main disorders or the main things that we see, I say would be, you know, obviously we have the post-traumatic stress disorder stuff. So PTSD, um, definitely substance use. The vast majority of that's going to be alcohol problems. Uh, a little bit of pain pills kind of depending on, on what's happened previously in that person's life. Uh, and then a lot of depression and a lot of anxiety. Those are the things that we see a lot. Um, we see a significant amount of relationship issues. Um, you know, so it's the stuff you would think. We also see a lot of sleep disorders, honestly. So, and that, that gets kind of complicated because we need to take a more medical and biopsychosocial angle. So we got to take a, you know, an integrated approach on a lot of these things too, but that's the stuff I see the most. Um, <laughs> I have a, a large, large case that I think of people that have childhood trauma too. And so, mm. you know, <laughs> Well, it's this simple. A lot of times people get into this industry because they want to help others like no one helped them. And if you think about it, that's pretty ripe with like the signs for childhood trauma. And a lot of times it's not necessarily, you know, I got abused as a kid. It can be stuff like I was really neglected or um, there was always chaos in my family or it's not just the obvious stuff. I think we focus a little bit too much maybe on the abuse side and forget that um, emotional neglect, physical neglect, and then the chaos of the home environment uh, can do so much negative uh, to a person, not only as a kid, but as they grow up into adulthood. And, and man, people gravitate towards wanting to help others when, when they felt like they weren't helped. You know, they're kind of like fixing, fixing, I hate to say like all hippy dippy, but you know, cause I'm not really that type <laughs> person, you know, but like kind of mending or overcompensating from the wounds of childhood, if you will. So yeah, mm-hmm. I see it a lot. Well, and it makes a lot of sense to me now, honestly, when I first heard that years ago, um, it, I was kind of skeptical. Um, and I, I shared with you that like I went through a program myself a few years ago called the battle within. And I remember having a conversation with a program manager director. And one of the things he said to me on the phone was, you know, people come here thinking they have one issue or overarching issue or thing that they, they want to resolve. It could be a critical incident. It could be something else. And he goes, but a lot of times we find that it's, it's stuff that happened in their childhood. And I was like, Oh, whatever, you know, I did not believe him, but, but now I, I get it. You know, I really get it. And, and one of the reasons is because you recommended a book during training that I read, and now I'm reading another one that you recommended called childhood disrupted. Yes. That one. I love that book. Uh, that was very, very eye opening. So, you know, for anybody listening, I know that people might poo poo that like, yeah, whatever that's, you know, that's not me. Um, I really think people need to understand the significance of what you're saying. Cause I think a lot of people, um, by just kind of looking into that, it could be helpful. Mm-hmm. And I could get all nerdy and this is again, a whole nother podcast in itself, but honestly, <laughs> sure. you know, the brain lays its foundation in childhood. So when we really get into it not, and simplifying it quite a bit, but when we really get into it, like your patterns of how your brain is going to function get laid while your brain is growing. And a lot of that growing happens within the first few years of life. And it definitely within the first few months of life. Um, and those patterns, if they are shaped by a chaotic environment or there's a, you know, shaping because of neglect or abuse, if you think about it, it's like, it's kind of like a foundation on a house. You know, if your foundation on your house is shaky and then you even know, even if you put this great, you know, stable, sturdy looking house on top of it, if the foundation is crap, like awesome house, but man, like one little shake up and you're screwed. So uh, I think that people really, really, really downplay how important those first few years of life are. And, 
and that it can really set you up for some stuff later. And actually, we know, statistically speaking, even people that are the most difficult to get to better or get to well are the ones that have childhood trauma. Uh, and we don't even we probably don't even have great measurements yet of what childhood trauma and neglect even really looks like. You know, there's the, you know, ACEs scores or uh, aversive childhood experiences Mm -hmm. scores. And that's very like well known. And anybody can look it up. Who's listening. It's like a 10 item questionnaire and, and that's all fine and dandy, but quite frankly, that's just the obvious signs of childhood trauma or neglect. It's like super obvious signs. Uh, We don't know enough about the subtleties yet. Um, But I will say that I think, that that is kind of, it's very important for people to realize that childhood trauma is important to address because sometimes your current stressors can't get better unless we go back a little bit. And I, I kind of giggle when I say that because I always cringe inside going, man, some first responders listening to this and thinking like, I want to go to therapy and have to talk about childhood crap, you know, and I get it. <laughs> I totally do. But the problem is it builds on it, you know, so sometimes we have to go back to go forward. Right. You talk about people joking about like, oh, I don't want to talk about my mommy or daddy issues. But really, I mean, that's just, you know, a way that we make fun, but but it makes a lot of sense to hear you describe it. So when you uncover something like that, maybe in one of your clients, how, and this is kind of, I know it's hard to generalize, but how, how hard is it to get them to understand why they need to do that so that they can move forward and heal. I mean, I'm guessing it could be kind of challenging. Oh my gosh. So challenging sometimes, but <laughs> you know, the patient population is challenging in itself. I'll be honest. And I love, I think that's why I'm uh-huh. working with, with first responders is because they are such, I'll be honest, pain in the ass patients, but awesome. You know? And so you mm-hmm. guys know it sure. too. And everybody who's listening is a first responder. <laughs> like, yeah, we are pain on the, in the ass. So, um, but <clears throat> I think, um, I think it's it's pretty challenging. So I have to use lots of analogies and break it down. Not simple, but just break it down into something that's observable. And that helps a lot for them to understand. Yeah. So if someone, if someone is resistant and, you know, I, I'm guessing at some point, do you just have to shift and just say, okay, or, or do you just keep plugging away until they realize, no, this is what we need to do before we go here? Well, um, so, so here's how we usually do this. I say, okay, fine. We'll revisit it later. And usually what I try to do is like build back up working on the present issue, because honestly, usually we do kind of have to work on the present issue first. Cause it's usually like, it's kind of like the, you know, here's the deal. If you think about it, like, like if you've got an infection in your arm, say it's like the sores open on your arm, um, you know, on the surface you have, you know, maybe broken skin or whatever, but you know, the infection is coming from inside. So, so if they want to work on, on, you know, healing up the topical infection, fine. And then I also know it's going to come right back. So then when it does, we go, okay, cool. So do we want to work on giving the antibiotics now, or do we want to go just back to the surface cream again? And so that's kind of, you know, again, tying it back to the physical and kind of helping people understand like, Hey, the mental isn't that much different than the physical. Yeah. Yeah. So besides all of the, the clients that you see, um, there's some other things that you do too. You work with a lot of law enforcement agencies, you do training. So tell us about all the other things that you do too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, we're kind of, you know, we're spread out, you know, a little, little jack of all trades right now. So what we do is, you know, we have kind of several kind of branches, I guess, in our practice. So Um, one of the things that we do is actually even like new hire psychological evaluations for agencies. So, Mm -hmm. um, uh, in Kansas where we're located, uh, the state requires a psychological exam for any new police hire in particular within the first year. Uh, most people do that before they ever even start the academy. And so we do those, we do a massive amount of those, I'd say. And that's been really interesting. Again, another talk for later about who's starting to enter into law (laughs) enforcement or not, but, um, So we do those. And then sometimes we do do some fit for duty stuff, which there's a negative connotation about fit for duties. And, you know, people always think like, oh, it's such a negative thing. And I'm going to lose my job. I'm like, here's the deal. Um, Agencies can present fit for duties better to people, I think. And they can say, look, also, we're sending you to doc to get evaluated. Um, Yes, we want you back at work, but we want you back at work and able to stay back at work. We want you healthy. And so I've had a lot of people come through for fit for duties and those fit for duties also result in treatment recommendations and then a really good bond with the therapist. And, Oh, look, now you're not, 
you know, careening at a fast pace with the wheels coming off towards a divorce. Look at that. You know, like a lot of positive things can come from evals. So um, I always like to do that little plug really quickly. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and then, Hey, no, I, I think it's important. Thank you for explaining that because you're absolutely right. Fit for duty does not have, there's nothing good surrounding that term as far as a first responder is concerned. No. And I, and honestly, like a lot of the fit for duties that we do here, I don't know about other places, but a lot of them, not all of them, of course, but a lot of them, man, we can really turn that corner. And that's the first time somebody's getting access to resources and that are meaningful and matter. And they're getting a plan together um, so that they can fix kind of the hot mess that's going on in their life. And it's not always negative. So we do that too. You know, we do those evals. Then we do a ton of treatment here. Um, we also do a lot of critical incident stuff. So we work about 20 to 30 officer involved shootings a year out of our office. Um, which is a lot. That's a lot. And actually yeah, we, we do it differently here uh, based on some research. I'm pretty research heavy and pretty research focused in the sense that I want to do what's best for the client and the agency. And we have to rely on research. This population is difficult to treat anyway. So um, we cannot be fiddling around with stuff that doesn't work. Um, and we need to be really proactive and preventative. So our, our uh, officer involved shooting protocol is to see people actually total of four times so it's not just once after you return to work. What we're starting to find is that, you know, some people immediately following a major critical incident, they will be really, really messed up. But some people will be totally fine for a month or two mm -hmm. or three or six. And so our protocol here at our office is we see people initially and then we see people one week after they return to work. And then we see people, see people again at the one week or sorry, the one month and then the, the three month mark. Um, because if we can catch symptoms and catch them early, it's kind of like cancer. I'm going to use that analogy. Like if you can catch cancer at stage one and get it fixed at stage one, um, that's awesome. Waiting till stage four is a real rough time. It's going to take a lot more work. And so we're trying to educate officers and departments about, you know, doing more check-ins more than just, just like the initial. Um, because if we can get you fixed early, we can identify a problem and fix it early, man, you're way more likely to be successful long-term. So we do that. Um, uh, and so then we also do consulting and teaching and we do peer support teaching and we do, um, the command level peer support teaching, which is super important. That's kind of a big thing to me. Cause I think if your leadership is toxic and unhealthy, man, you guys all know the phrase, you know, who runs downhill, let's say it that way. So <laughs> <laughs> you can say the other word I know, if you want. <laughs> really hard to be better at, um, being, <laughs> less, uh, less like a sailor. So, um, so <laughs> I would say, well, it's okay on this podcast, just <laughs> in case you were wondering. <laughs> good, 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 good. Awesome. Awesome. So, um, definitely, definitely the leadership stuff is pretty cool to me just cause man, I see toxic leaders really, really negatively impact, um, officers and firefighters and paramedics and dispatchers all over the place. Um, and then we do some consulting too. I do a little bit of consulting for private industry. So that's a lot. I feel like I've been talking a lot. So, but there you go. Well, we want you to talk a lot. Good. That's why I asked you to be on the show. You have a lot to say and you have so many cool things going on. So, uh, but yeah, just to like kind of piggyback on what you just said about your command level peer support, I was going to ask you about that anyway. And, and just even like, obviously people aren't going to be able to see this, but I keep looking at you and I see this really cool picture behind you of this horse. And I don't know if this is where it's from, but I know you have a big, big affiliation with the War Horses for Veterans organization. And I actually had Patrick on my show um, a few months ago. And that is the reason I bring it up is because that's also part of the command level peer support training that you do. So if you don't mind talking a little bit more about that and kind of telling people about that and, and somebody who may be listening, who's actually a leader or or might suggest that one of their commanders go, how, how would they go about getting into that class? Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so um, command level peer support's pretty freaking awesome. Um, so <laughs> Mid-America Regional Council, there's a lady by the name of Pam Apoka, and I'm pretty sure you had her on too. She's wonderful. Yes, I did. Good, good, good. She's <laughs> wonderful. She's super innovative, and she's always got these great, great big ideas. And so um, mm -hmm. I always like to give credit where credit's due. You know, command level peer support was not my idea. It was from Pam Apoka and at, at Mid-America Regional Council. So um, credit there. Um, she contacted me and was like, hey we should do peer support, but we should do it for command level. And, and I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. And, and so for those of you listening, um, really peer support is primarily for frontline staff, kind of as it's structured, at least in the Midwest here. And if you guys think about it, like 
if you're talking about difficult stuff um, that you've been through, do you really want to have a commander in the room while that's happening? Most of us would say no, you know, like, but guys also commanders have a whole nother level of stress too, that we can't ignore. Um, yes, I understand that they are not necessarily out on the streets fighting crime and they're primarily fighting emails. Uh, but you know, like, like that, that there's some stress behind that too. And also just because you move up to command level doesn't mean that your you know, 15 to 20 years of street level stress just disappeared or your street level trauma disappeared. Mm-hmm. And so oftentimes commanders have trauma uh, or stuff that they haven't dealt with, or they are viewing the world super negatively and, 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 and you know, mentally not in a great space. And then when they get promoted and they add stress on top of it, um, the trauma stays and then the administrative stress comes on top. And if you don't deal with that stuff, it, it spreads and, and it can spread really far and wide. The higher you promote, the more damage you can do if you're not well. Um, and so command level peer support is really aimed at, hey, let's keep people well as commanders, because that has got to be part of a total ecology of keeping a department well. So, um, yeah, so, so, so that's kind of how I got involved. That's kind of the theory or the mindset behind it. It's been one of the kind of more fun and rewarding things I've done lately, because these commanders will really open up. Of course, I'm not going to share anything, but like, Man, of course. Not. Yeah, no. <laughs> I, I mean, it just, you know, you have to trust me and believe me when I say that I've seen some really good insight come from that. And then kind of like the aha moments that come from like, oh, maybe that guy or gal that really frustrates me that I have under my leadership. Maybe they're not doing that because they're a jerk or an asshole. Maybe they're doing that because they're not well. And and so I think that right. the compassion has kind of grown for their people. And that is, I mean, it gives me, it gives me chills because that's important. So, um, so part of the, the command peer support, kind of getting back to the war horses thing is, you know, we do like three days of classroom work and all, you know, blah, 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 death by PowerPoint, academic stuff. And you got to get the content across and then really to kind of hit the points and really kind of, you know, drive the messaging home. We spend the fourth day out at War Horses for Veterans, which is an organization uh, here in Kansas City, kind of way far south Kansas City. Um, But their focus, I know it's called War Horses for Veterans, but they have a veteran program and a first responder program. And um, basically we take all the classroom work and we we apply it in, in with the horses. And horses are excellent biofeedback in a weird way. And so like your energy that you show to the horse, the horse will pick up on and directly reflect it back to you. And, and so it is an insight building tool. Like I have seen no other. I have done all sorts of like assessment based trainings and academic trainings and blah, 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 coaching, counseling, you know, like, and man, uh, it's kind of humbling, like. I've been to 12 years of school or whatever. And then just to see a horse, like teach the lesson I've been trying to yak at a commander about for, for six months. It's a little humbling experience. But it's good. It's good. Cause the horse will give you feedback right back. It does not care who you are. If you have poor energy in with that horse, that horse is not going to do what you want it to do. And it's hard to explain, but it's a, it's a great experience. Yeah. And you are right. It is hard to explain. So I, I visited war horses, but I, I didn't go through any like training or anything there. The, the time I went, it was freezing. So I got to say hi to the horses, but that was about it. But I did at another place when I went through the battle within, I did do a little bit of equine therapy. And I think probably the way it was done is a little bit different than how war horses does it. But I'm just, I'm saying that because I was, I love horses and I was excited about this part of that week but I had no idea. Like I had, I was blown away at how impactful that particular part of my retreat, if that's what you want to call it, was because it really, you are right. Like they pick up on everything. I could not believe the horse. It was just such a weird experience too. Cause the horse I chose was my husband's name. <laughs> Carl. So first of all, that was kind of, kind of interesting. We're Freudian right there. Okay. My, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there you go. And, and sparing you all the details, but by the end, the horse was like literally leaning on me. Like I felt like the horse was hugging me. Like it was, and it was not like that in the beginning. So it was just, it was a really impactful experience, but you're right. It is kind of hard to put into words. It is, it is. And I'll be the first to tell you, like, 
I got approached by War Horses. This is kind of like the consulting part of the stuff they do. I got approached by War Horses, specifically Jason Clee Packett, War Horses for Veterans, who runs their first responder program. Um, and, you know, I was like listening to their pitch and they're like, you should come on board. You should try this thing. And and I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. Because um, I, I, I'll i be honest with you, I am, I am largely aversive to hippity dippity methods. So... <laughs> As I call them. So, you know, I'm a scientist. Is that an official, is that an official term? Hippity dippity? I think it's, yes, it's absolutely. If I need is here, I think we're fine. Um, but, you know, like, I, you know, I'm a scientist, damn it. And so <laughs> there are some elements, I think, of what I do that I really kind of, I can't really explain exactly why it works, but it works. And so um, this is not what we do at War Horses is not like a hug a horse moment. You know, you're not going to be spinning the end of the you know, time with your horse, like wrapped around its neck. Like, that's not what we're doing, y'all. Like what we're doing is we're, we're basically showing you the energy you bring into a room directly affects the people around you. The energy you bring to a call directly affects the people around you. And you can choose your own adventure on that, but choose wisely. And I think one of the things that we're finding, and I, I haven't really talked to you about this too much, but is that when people are chronically traumatized in particular, they have very, very, very poor um, insight. So their their self insight in particular, um, their interoception also, like what it feels like to be them, starts to fade away a little bit. Um, and we see that in traumatized brains. And so when you have to re-engage with the horse in particular, you have to start paying attention to what is it like to be me? What is it like to be me in this moment? Um, and I have zero science to support this, but I have a, a theory that what's happening is we're kind of turning back on some brain regions that get turned off when we are chronically stressed and traumatized. That is a theory alone. I got no facts for that right now, but um, maybe one day when I get a little free time, ha ha, I'll look into that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what's happening with the horse. So. That's fascinating. So when you, when, when you observe someone like that, right, that you can see that's what's going on and how, what do you do with the horse to try to illustrate or get that point across to that person? Or is that even, can you even explain that? Gosh, (laughs) man. Um, okay. So it is a little difficult to explain. I think what I'll say is like, if you bring, say you're like really ampy and you bring like kind of that overly amped energy into the arena with the horse. Mm -hmm. So the horse is going to be like, I don't understand what you're doing, dude. What do you need from me? And also I kind of want to move away from you because your ampy energy is making me ampy and like, I don't like it. Yeah. And so usually what I'll say is like, Hey, how, how is the horse reading you? What, what's happening here? Um, and then they have to stop and think about, okay, well, what juju am I bringing up here and what, what's it doing to the mm-hmm. animal? And then I also, I say, Hey, how are you going to change it? You figure it out. Um, and I kind of like that strategy as opposed to telling them what to do. Cause, um, I think there's a lot of value in learning it through failing, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. And I know that war horses does a lot besides, you know, the command level peer support. And I know you're not here just to talk about war horses, but I just want to make sure the listeners understand they do a lot of other things too. They are very um, open to having, and I don't know if you've been a part of this, like peer support teams oh, also yeah. coming and visiting and going through war horses. Do you, do you ever do anything with them besides just the command level training? Well, actually, yes. Can you, can you speak to that a little oh, bit? Oh, yeah, yeah. We do okay. a ton of stuff. So it's not just command level stuff. Yes, we kind of started with that angle and talking about that angle, but I think that's great to kind of point out that we also have peer support teams come out there. We have really stressed out like shifts, like say... You know, we have an area of Kansas City in particular that's like really, really, really stressful to work in uh, for so many reasons that I won't get into. But we've had a shift from from a specific department and specific zone come out just to decompress um, and have like not only just some team building stuff, but kind of also maybe try to help them slow down enough so that when they do have to go back to work, they're in the right headspace. Um, and so we do that. So we kind of do targeted interventions. We do peer support groups. And then I have patients that I will independently send out there one-on-one because like I kind of mentioned earlier, I can talk to them blue in the face about something in therapy, but sometimes I need them to go out there and experience like, Hey dude, you're bringing bad energy. That's why A, B, and C is happening in your life. 
and I can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk, but until the horse immediately shows them that back once they're out there war horses, it's like it doesn't click. And so I get miles and miles and miles, uh, you know, lots of mileage, I would say, out of sending my own individual clients out to war horse too. Well, and it's funny you say that because the time I went out there to visit, I met one of your clients Aww. that was just there hanging out. And it was kind of neat that, that, you know, he was the one that kind of showed me around. That's so. cool. And I think that, you know, one of the other things about healing and about, especially treating post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, is that we downplay the importance of a sense of camaraderie and community. And when we talk about mm-hmm. healing, that is a, like an underlying factor that is really hard to replicate in today's society. Like you need to bond with a peer group. You need to feel included in something and you need to feel a part of something bigger than yourself. And, um, and that's why a lot of people get into this industry to feel bigger, you know, part of something bigger than themselves. But I think that, you know, through stress and trauma, they can kind of get disconnected from that. So, um, you know, I've also had a ton of people that have really engaged at war horses in another way, which is the social way. Um, and, and then they feel a part of a community and a group. And that, that has, I'm not even kidding. That has saved people's lives. And I, I hate to be dramatic, Mm. but I think it's true. And so, yeah. Well, and yeah, I mean, you say something that, that I know just like a little bit of, but it just makes so much sense just in the little bit I've seen doing peer support. Like, I think it's so true that people who are experiencing like either post-traumatic stress or trauma they feel like they're the only person in the world that's going through it. So that isolation, that shame, you know, all the things that go with that. Um, and that's why I, I really believe in the power of peer support because that's the, like the last thing they want to do. And then yet it's the thing that they need the most. And so that's, that's the hardest thing to, to, to let people know that, Hey, reach out. That's what you need to do. You're not. And then once, once they see that they're not the only one, and, and that's part of why I wanted to do this podcast is for people to understand that they aren't the only ones that are going through this. And it may not look the same as far as like whatever it is that led up to that point, but the feeling is the same. And so it, I just, I'm so glad you said that because pe- I don't think people can hear that enough. I agree. I a hundred percent agree with you. And if you even just look at the numbers, again, me kind of being sciencey on this, you know, one in five actively working first responders is likely to meet diagnostic criteria for PTSD. And, you know, that number goes up mm-hmm. or down depending on kind of the environment you work in or what your role is in, in a department or in an agency. But I think if we just knew that number, like, it's like, oh, huh, full diagnostic criteria, man, that's, that's fairly serious. And so if you just look around your agency, and I like to do this exercise in class a lot, uh, and you just count out five people, you know, one of those five people meets diagnostic criteria for, for PTSD. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't even count depression, and anxiety, all the other things that can be going on. So I think, you know, helping, having numbers helps normalize it too. Yeah, that makes sense. And one thing too, you already kind of alluded to this, but if you don't mind speaking to this, cause I think there's a lot of times people think, and I heard the term trauma envy. I think it was from Angie Jones for the first time, but like they think, oh, I didn't go through this big incident. Like I didn't, I wasn't involved in an officer involved shooting. So, you know, how I'm feeling or what I'm experiencing, I don't, you know, it's not as big a deal as, as this other person, but that's obviously not the way to look at it. Right. Correct. Um, so it's not a, uh, how, about, how about this? Uh, it's not a competition. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, everybody's so freaking different. And like I said earlier, like, you know, when I worked at, at KU Med, I could do, you know, burn unit, trauma unit, all that kind of stuff. No problem. You know, people who were dying a slow, painful death right in front of me, man, that got me. And so it's just a really good example of like every single person has a template for what they can tolerate and not tolerate. And you don't know what it is until you get in there. And so comparing it is absolutely pointless. And honestly, the other thing is most people's traumas have common themes. And so, you know, you might've been in this like huge incident or your incident might've been maybe a little bit smaller, but the theme could be the same. And those themes are things like, Mm -hmm. um, I can no longer trust my abilities or I can no longer trust my safety in the world or I'm powerless or I have no control. Like those are the same themes. They can get activated by different things, but oftentimes that theme is the same. 
So I think that that's kind of a, a right. better way to maybe look at it. Yeah, no, thank you for, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you for explaining it in that way. Cause I think a lot of times, I think that's pretty prevalent. Like I think, I feel like a lot of people, um, I don't know if I'm even going to say this right, but they don't like deserve because they didn't go through something, this big thing. And a lot of times what I notice and, and I can even speak for myself is that it's not just even just one thing sometimes. Oh yeah. It's like a whole bunch huh. of things. Yes. So you're, you're talking about, I call it the hairball of trauma. So, so, oh, yeah. okay. so, and <laughs> look, we're ladies. So we know like, you know, like when you get a, let's talk about a shower drain, for example. And you know, like when the shower water sure. starts backing yeah. up a little bit and you know how there's one little hair that loops over the drain and, but the shower water's backing up. So you're like, what? And so you scratch on that one little hair and then you're, you pull it up and you're like, oh my God, look at this. You know, like, uh -huh. <laughs> so that's yeah. what happens to first responders a lot is we have one little loopy hair over the top that we see, but we see that the water's backing up and our life ain't going very well. And then once we scratch it, that one little, we're like, oh, damn it. <laughs> Look at all this I've accumulated. <laughs> I am totally stealing that term, hairball yes. of trauma. I love that. <laughs> and I'm going to take this analogy <laughs> even further, which I, maybe it's too far, but I also tell people, because sometimes they get overwhelmed by that, right? So they're like, well then, you know, oh my gosh, then I'll never get through this. And I say, no, 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 hold on, hold on. Just like if you have like, maybe like a, a ball is a ball of string, for example, or even a hairball that, you know, after you get the first one or two, like things untangled, it gets much easier to untangle the rest of it. That's how trauma treatment works. So, you know, we mm. might work on one trauma, but it, the cool thing is like, once we get through that one trauma that we start working on, the other ones unwind a lot faster. In fact, some of them just naturally unwind themselves. So that's pretty cool. And I think also kind of hopeful for people when they get overwhelmed by like, oh man, my hairball's really bad, you know, bathtub's overflowing. <laughs> like, like it's not that, it's not that overwhelming once we really get in there. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you probably a really hard question to answer, but I'm going to ask oh, great. you anyway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think I know what you're probably going to say, but I have to ask it because like, if you have someone, you know, especially like other first responders, maybe it's like a peer support thing, a coworker, and you know, you can just tell that they, they need some help. Um, but they're resistant to it. I mean, I, I find that more people aren't as resistant as they used to, to be, but you still run into people that, yeah, no, that's, that's not for me. I don't need that. Kind of like what you said earlier. How do you approach that person? Um, and, and talk to them, like, what's the best way to, to go about it? I know you can't make somebody do something they don't want to do, but is there anything that you can recommend or what, what do you talk about to your peer support teams about going about addressing that with, with sure. people? So I think you're very accurate in the sense that you can't make people do anything. Right. Um, but I think you start with, first of all, if you have a great relationship with somebody, um, that always helps. It's so much easier to talk to people when you already have relationships established. Um, so I think starting with a good relationship is important. I would say, you know, sure. the other part is one of the things that kind of, it's like a pet peeve of mine when I talk to peer support classes is, um, I think sometimes we, we forget like, Hey, if somebody's struggling, it's not the person struggling's responsibility to come to you, get up mm -hmm. off your rear, go talk to them. You know, you go approach them. Um, I, I always like reinforce that, like, come on y'all come on. You clearly know they're suffering. Let's get up. Let's go. Don't wait for them to come to you. Come on. And so also, I think the other thing I tell a lot of peer supporters is um, persistence beats resistance. So, you know, mm. socially appropriate, of course, but like persistence beats resistance. So sometimes you'll have that first conversation with someone and they will blow you off. And then you'll have the second conversation and they'll blow you off. Fine. Whatever. Okay keep going, don't give up. And then you have the third and then you keep checking in on them on the fourth and the fifth. And what you're doing is you're starting to just leave the door open for them. So when they are ready, they come approach you. Cause you've. Yeah. That's another good nugget. Persistence beats resistance. I love that. No, you can also apply that to your dating life <laughs> if you'd like. So anyway, um, <laughs> I don't have a dating life. I'm married, but that, that could be good advice Younger for others. <laughs> um, oh man. But I think it's just important to, to realize like 
just leave the door open. Keep the door open. Don't yeah. don't get frustrated. Mm-hmm. Don't get butt hurt because they didn't take your advice or they didn't want your help. Like the action of approaching them and leaving the door open, that is the meaningful thing. So don't get upset. I really like that persistent. I mean, I'm, I'm serious because I've, you know, just myself, I've experienced it and I've had the other people on the team, like, Hey, I've reached out. Well, and I've, I've just kind of intuitively said, well, don't just reach out one time, you know, keep, keep it up. So without being right. too pushy, you know, sometimes people don't want to necessarily hear advice and you should do this and you should do that. But there's, I feel like there's a way to approach someone. And that's why it's so important to have good training in this, because sometimes people don't know how to approach those types of situations. We may be really good at our jobs, but for some reason, interacting with our peers is like a whole new game. It totally is. Yeah. I think people are kind of afraid of uh, maybe, maybe making somebody angry or, or concerns like, Oh man, they're, they're going to, you know, they're going to start avoiding me because I keep hounding them about their own mental health. And I'm like, yeah, but look, it, it, isn't that better than, than the alternative, which is not approaching them and then having something happen, you know? Yeah. Oh no, definitely. One, one last thing that I do want to ask you about, cause I, I've, I've really seen this a lot. Um, cause I've had, you know, I'm, I've already retired and of retirement age, even though I still work. I've had a lot of friends that have retired in the last couple of years, people who are getting ready to retire. Can you just speak a little bit to why addressing these things before people retire is so important? And I, I think you might do some training on this too, but I'm not quite sure. So I have a class just about this exact topic that, um, many of my Metro agencies have actually had me come out and Um, take like people who are about to retire, maybe they have like two to three years out. And we actually teach a class on like mentally preparing for retirement and then preparing in like a healthy mindset. Because what we do find is that one of our highest risk groups for suicide in particular in law enforcement, uh, fire numbers are a little bit harder to come by accurately. But um, one of our highest risk groups for suicide is retirees. Uh, And if you think Mm -hmm. about it, like your job is so cool. They make television shows about y'all. Just remember that. Okay. Um, they do not make television shows about accountants. All right. Sorry to accountants out there, but like, sorry, it's not that interesting. (laughs) Your day to day is not as wild and crazy. So, um, that can really suck once you move through the retirement process. Like you're not doing the fun, cool stuff anymore. The adrenaline kind of goes away. And for the most part, when people start getting towards retirement, the adrenaline rush is definitely gone. But what they don't realize sometimes is that the need to be needed or the need to be engaged in something really interesting and high stimulus or high stress, they don't realize how much they've been living off of that. And so people will move to retirement and then sometimes symptoms of trauma will pop back up or depression will pop up or anxiety will even pop up kind of randomly. Um, and then oftentimes that can come with some drinking behaviors that are, that are not so great. Um, not for everybody, but for some, cause you know, you don't have a lot of obligations anymore. And so when we talk about kind of retiring in a healthy way, I always encourage people to think about like what need is getting met psychologically at your job, because that psychological need will not go away just cause you've retired. You will still have the same psychological needs. So, so I'm going to use myself as an example. Um, little random fact about me is, is I used to own an aerial acrobatics studio. So I used to teach like Cirque du Soleil stuff. That's probably a trademark. Can't say that name. Sorry. Wow. Um, That's but, super but, cool. Uh, so I used to teach aerial <laughs> acrobatics and, and that was so freaking fun. And it was also while I was still, uh, while I was in private practice and, and it wasn't that many years ago that I was doing that. Um, but ultimately I needed to make a shift and I needed to basically retire, if you will, from that life and, and, and sell my studio and move towards working primarily in the industry I do now, which is first responders, of course. And, and I knew that the psychological need that I was having met by owning that aerial studio was, it was super fun to watch a kid like get up on a trapeze and have the absolute time of their life and like grow and, and kind of nurture. And, and so that was like the growth and nurturing need was getting met through that business. And so when I sold it, I knew I was going to have that need. 
uh, anyway. And so I started fostering puppies because I knew my need. Yeah. It wasn't going to go away. And so it was like a really nice bridge for me. Sure. Um, because, and I, and I just apply it back to, to first responder culture. Cause when you retire, your psychological needs will still be there. I have a need to nurture and watch something grow. And so you got to keep feeding that need somewhere else. A lot of times for first responders, it's, I have a need to help, or I have a need to make an impact larger than myself or some other need, but you've got to think about that. And it takes some time, um, to really kind of get your head around what psychological needs do I need to get met after I retire? Uh, that's really good information. That's something that I think all agencies really need to think about, not just having training, like you just said about somebody like you coming in and discussing it, but maybe like for ver- several years leading up to that point, like have, really getting people to start taking proactive mm-hmm. measures so that they, they're not in this stuck place when they Absolutely. retire. And I also tell people like, make sure you include your spouse in your retirement planning, like the discussions, because the whole dynamic can shift dramatically once you're home all the time. So, <laughs> yes, I've heard that yeah. those stories, actually. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but don't, don't, um, I, I say don't, don't tread too lightly on the fact that also trauma symptoms, if you had them and didn't take care of them, they will pop up too sometimes. So if you think about it, one of the ways that we keep trauma symptoms down is to stay really busy and to stay really um, like mm-hmm. excitably activated and our careers allow us to do that. So when we don't have the, you know, the normal distraction of our career, sometimes trauma stuff will, will percolate to the surface. So just FYI, it weirds people out sometimes, but it can happen. So. Well, it makes sense. I mean, you go from being, even if you're, you know, you're a commander when you retire and you're not out on the street or something like that, you're still, you go to work and you've kind of got that underlying, just, you know, just response, like constant, like your stress response could still be activated, even though it's like you said, like it could be an email, it could be, you know, an employee you have to deal with. It's still the same feeling in your body that your body is continually experiencing. And then to go from that every day, going to work, um, and then nothing, like if that's, it's, that's how you retire. Some people go from that to being completely done that, that would be difficult. It's, it's awful for some people. And and even like the command level stuff, if you think about it, yeah, you're making big, giant, important decisions every day. And that's also true for like street level folks working too. And then you go to like, what am I going to have for dinner? Um, and what color are we going to paint the bathroom? And that's not as exciting. So, <laughs> Right. Yes. <laughs> it sounds kind of nice though. Personally. I always tell people, <laughs> I always tell people, like, Hey, I know you're getting ready to retire, but like, there's only so many times you can remodel your bathroom. So find something else. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. That's good advice. So, and then just kind of like, I was going to go here anyway, but this is kind of a good segue. I was going to talk to you about therapists, people who do the work that you do, um, how is it that, um, or how should, I should say, therapists, like, you know, what, what kinds of things do they need to do? Because to me, I've, I've talked to other therapists before who sometimes will tell me that, you know, they're in therapy, they see a lot of therapists themselves. How, how do you recommend people that do this kind of work, you know, for back, lack of a better way of saying this, take care of themselves? Um, because I think sometimes when we get wrapped up in this work that it can be hard to, to remember to take care of ourselves sometimes. Oh, totally. And I, I'll be honest with you, like the kind of the self care stuff is not my bailiwick. It's not, <laughs> I have a, I have a weird way of personally self caring. I think my self care is like, okay, well what, what cool thing am I going to do tomorrow? And like, you know, kind of mentally kind of challenging myself regularly. I know it sounds weird, but that's my version of self care. Um, but uh, I just like to challenge and push. That's how I kind of relax um, in a weird, odd way. I'll be honest with you. Um, people want to control the volume of their life. And my volume is turned up quite high. Oftentimes I move kind of fast. So, <laughs> um, so, you know, my version of relaxation is sometimes looks like other people's version of stimulation. But um, I think that for, first of all, like the therapists and the, the, you know, people that get into this work to help first responders, I think that, you know, you can't be faint of heart. Like you, it, it takes a certain temperament. Um, and, but when it does come to relaxing and, and like self care, I guess what I'd tell people is, yeah, you know, go to therapy, definitely go to therapy if you need to unpack it. And then also 
really start kind of reflecting on and working on yourself with regards to understanding that there's only so much in life you can control. And you got to be really comfortable mm-hmm. with that. When I was in grad school, I had an excellent supervisor tell me um, that the healthiest place you can be is wanting control over your life, seeking control over your life, but also fully coming to terms and understanding that you'll never have it and being okay with it. Yeah. And that last part's really hard. Mm-hmm. I'm okay with what I can't control because there's so much that happens in this industry that you can't control both on the, on the first responder side and on the therapist side. Um, and then, you know, really kind of settling into that headspace is really important. Yeah, you're right. That uncertain, just knowing that everything day in and day out is uncertain and nothing stays the same and you can't control it. That's, that's very, it's difficult for me personally. It's something that I struggle with and then let alone the type of people that are attracted to this career field. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. And I'm, I'm pretty, I mean, this, I don't, I, I listen to a lot of one of my favorite psychologists is actually Jordan Peterson. So I'm going to steal this from Jordan Peterson. Oh, yeah. quickly. He was, he has kind of really focused on the importance of people who are really mentally healthy are people that move problems into goals. So, you know, you mm, see, a, yeah, I, I, I love like that. that. Like, like you take a problem and yes, it's a problem and you can fixate and you can throw a pity party on the problem, but at some point you need to move it into the goals category. And so how do I, how do I take a problem which has things in it that I can and can't control? How do I take it and I move it into a goal, which means I focus on what I can control. And I think that that's where like true resiliency lies is that, that type of stuff. Oh, I love that. You know, I've heard of him and I've, I've not read any of his books yet, but I'm going to make sure and put one of his yes, on yes, my yes. list. Look at me giving you reading <laughs> lists. I love it. <laughs> oh yeah. You've given me a lot. So, well, you know, I'm glad you said that though about yourself personally though, because it's really good insight because it's not a one size fits all. Like I have people that I've talked to that they're like, they swear by therapy. That's all. That's what has, what keeps them sane. I have other people don't want to go to therapy. They, they use like their fitness or workout routine as like, that's what keeps them grounded. So it's different things for different people. And I think that's, you know, the bottom line, but, but do something right. Like do something that, that, that keeps you sane, I guess, for lack of better yeah, way yeah. saying you gotta that. Find what it is. Cause I think that one size fits all is really, mm-hmm. really narrow way to look at it. Um, you know, you've yeah. got to try a wide variety and figure out what's really kind of best for you. I always also kind of caution people on, especially if they've never tried therapy, I'll be really honest with you. I do say at least try it to make sure that you're not just avoiding something kind of big. You're like covering it up by like chronically exercising or, you know, getting obsessive about, you know, X, Y, or Z thing. Like, you know, double check in either with a therapist or like a really, really close friend who's really kind of knowledgeable and mature about like, is this coping strategy a healthy coping strategy or am I just covering up trauma or whatever else? So yeah, and then if if that's the case, you gotta go to therapy, so. Yeah. For sure. Well, Dr. Prohaska, you are a wealth of information and I have really enjoyed talking same, to you same, same. today. This has been really fun. If, um, well, let me ask you this before we end our conversation. Is there anything else that we didn't talk about that you want to mention to the audience or oh, can you gosh. think of anything? Um, man, we covered a lot. Um, I think I would just say like, Hey, no matter what you're going through, I promise you there is a way out. Uh, it just might take a hundred different iterations, but you know, get help, uh, rely on peers. Uh, also I always say build your support system, like make sure you have really, really solid social relationships, uh, in this industry because, um, it's stressful. And those are the things that will usually really kind of support you all the way through. So that's, that's kind of my, my big tips, but we could, we could talk more some other day on some other stuff. That's all complicated and long. <laughs> Well, I might have to just take you up on that and invite you back for some other future, future episodes. If since you're throwing it out there, (laughs) you did, I'll hold you to it. So if anybody listening wants to find you, like get, you maybe get a hold of you to do some training at their agency or or whatever the case may be. So um, we have a website. So if you just Google insight, public safety and forensic consulting, um, it'll come right up and our contact information's on there and, 
Um, I've got excellent support staff and an office manager who I don't deserve to have because she's lovely and um, she's wonderful and I, I'd die without her. So um, yeah, contacting an office is probably the best way. And then I've got an Instagram uh, profile that I add some stuff to. I'm not super active, but it's um, the first responder psychologist. So yeah. Okay. I did not know that. I'm going to have to make sure I follow oh, you really? on Instagram. <laughs> I feel like I'm <laughs> you're going to have to follow the I podcast will. back though. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, thanks again. It's, it's been a delight and we will take you up on seeing awesome. you again. Thank in the you future. so much guys. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you find value in this episode, please share it, give us a review. And if you'd like to be notified of future episodes and want to receive our future newsletter, you can shoot me an email at wendy at blueline you can also subscribe on our Podbean website. Please contact me with suggestions for future guests or topics you'd like to hear about. Or if you're local and need help locating a resource therapist or just want to reach out, I'd love to hear from you. I'm stuck here.